So welcome to our online work-based mentor event. Today's session is about exploring the role of the work-based mentor for a level seven senior apprenticeship. And I think it's really important to understand that an engaged mentor will have significant impact and positive impact on our apprentices. So we're going to hear today from a current apprentice and her work-based mentor, which we will chat about shortly. So we've also got a, um, a guest speaker called Dr Courtney Owens, who will share with us her thoughts on the incomplete leader. So hopefully that's whetted your appetite ever so slightly. So introductions, our guest speakers today, we've got a senior leader apprenticeship, Sophie Mallinson, who is the commercial manager at Joseph Gleave and Son, and Sophie's work-based mentor, John Shaw, who's the managing director and owner of Joseph Gleave and Son. So they'll be giving some insight on what it's like to be involved. And then we'll come on to speak with uh, Dr. Courtney Owens, who will give us uh, some insight into um, the incomplete leader. So I'm going to start with a question for John. So everybody who is on the call, please feel free to ask any question you can think of that arises as we go along. Just to give you some background, Sophie it has joined us last March, so she's in nearly a year into her programme. And John, her work-based mentor, has taken on this uh, role of work-based mentor. So we're going to just ask John, um, what the reality is like, John, opposed to what you expected, how is it different from what you expected before you started this programme? Over to John. Well, it's an interesting question, that, Carol. Um, I think that uh, having the confidence of Manchester University behind us gives me a great deal of comfort. I've got a very good structured programme which we researched in to consider whether we're going to put um, Sophie on this course as the commercial manager. Um, so the, the, the having the confidence in the structure program, and there wasn't a great deal of difference between what I, what's in reality to the expectations. And that's due to really the, the university having a, a very structured program. I also, also think that it's important that whoever people select to put on this uh, leadership course, really um, understands the candidate um, that look at their strengths and weaknesses and how they can apply their skill set to the work that's going to follow. Um, you know, I can say that each candidate will no doubt have different strengths. Some people are going to be uh, of different skills, but to let the person to express themselves with confidence um, and the, the, the program, I think, really, Carol, um, back to your question is you've got to have confidence in the in the candidate um, or the apprentice, I should say. Sounds like a bit like a Lord Sugar here. <laughs> 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 a bit like having confidence in the candidate. And, you know, it's a huge investment um, companies are putting into uh, to allow that candidate or apprentice to go on the course. But I think the payback is, is significant. So I think the parallels is is, is the, the structure and organisation um, that Manchester University have put into this programme um, really uh, provides me the comfort to know that there is not so much a, a, a significant divergence that I thought initially. Did you expect that Sophie would be applying what she was learning so quickly on the programme, John, or was that un unexpected? I think it was um, you know, unexpected. I think for, for the benefit of uh, the other people, organisations, we're an SME based in Manchester, you know, 40 people in the organisation are working out of two locations. Um, and, you know, the company goes back to 1833. So we're 190 years old. Um, so I'm looking for a business transformation. Um, so when I look at the candidate um, of uh that we, we we chose for sophie to go on my view was is there a real appetite for this candidate to learn and then deploy what she's learned on the course directly into the business in different areas and uh sophie's done that but i've had the confidence to allow sophie to explore and 
feedback to me to say where she can help rather than me direct. So it's that type of relationship, I think, very key with your apprentice. Excellent. Thanks, John. Sophie, can I just ask you what your experience is? You know, you're working with John as your work-based mentor. You're working with me, obviously, as your practice-based tutor. What's been your uh, experience, keep using that word, so far? <laughs> Well, I think John and I worked closely together before the apprenticeship anyway. Um, so I think that's massively helped us, um, you know, like make the transition when we into like work based mentor and apprentice. Um, so I definitely think having someone who you already work closely with, you know, will be beneficial to an apprentice. Um, and I think it helps as well. You know, I'm comfortable enough to say to John, because when you're going through each unit, you know, you're supposed to apply yourself whilst you're doing it rather than sort of waiting for the whole thing to be complete and then doing it. So you need to have someone that you're confident enough to go to and say, look, you know, we've been learning this in this unit and I want to implement it by doing this um, and sort of being able to give the reasons why and sort of knowing that you won't get too much pushback perhaps from that person and that you know they're going to give you the time as well to sit and have that conversation because I think probably you know everyone in this call time is very very precious and um yeah so just trying to make sure that you get those time that time together to do that is really important um and in terms of Carol working with you a practice-based tutor <laughs> loved every minute <laughs> it's been great <laughs> no, seriously it has we've we've been um, scheduled as you know and you're a great resource to have from like John says you know from the university in itself um we've sort of we have our quarterly meetings but we also have our monthly meetings as well just one-on-one -on -one to catch up um, but also it helps to brainstorm ideas because, you know, you've got the experience of working with previous cohorts as well. Um, it's sort of perhaps sprouting some ideas for me to help get some more sort of KSBs in there, um, which has been really beneficial, really useful. Excellent. Guys, whoever, if you've just joined, Ed, could you put your mic on mute, please? Sorry, it's got, thank you. <laughs> I think... <laughs> John, just a question on, in terms of, we have the, the tripartite meetings, they're called quarterly review meetings with your cohort. How does that benefit you? Because that's a full hour you have to give up of your time to sit with Sophie and I and reviewing the modules that she's done so far. How do you find those? And do you could you give any advice to other people on the call that are thinking of taking on this role or are currently starting on that role as a work-based mentor? Yeah, uh, Carol, I think it's, um, you, you, first of all, you've got to be committed to the programme. I um, feel that the, the, you need to um, look at providing dedicated time so that it, the, the, the programme breaks down how much time they need to have per week. And you've got to stay pretty uh, strict to allow the apprentices to have that sufficient time off in the workplace to go to a quiet room or an office or a quiet environment so they can actually do their uh, their work, whether it's uh, tut online tutorials or writing up some work or doing some investigation. You need to give them some, that sufficient time. That's absolutely paramount. So for me as an SME, the very thought is, you know, of allowing Sophie as the apprentice to be uh, working in the company on university work for a period of say six or seven hours per week was quite frightening. I must admit it was quite frightening, you know, but I then thought, well, okay, if you give that dedication, straight away there's gonna be a feedback. So um, working then closely with Sophie, yeah, give you a dedicated time um, and, uh, and a quiet meeting, uh, meeting place. I think that um, to understand the strengths and weaknesses of your candidate, your apprentice, is important. Um, and really what you want as a business to uh, achieve out of it, and then ensure that you're keeping those objectives um, uh, at the form, for, forefront of your mind. So what I was looking for is somebody in business that, you know, I, I've been in business for four, over 40 years, and it's my, my business that I've, I've built up over that period of time. So to me, allowing people to have um, uh, freedom of thought and applying that 
in my business and knowing they're, they're bringing it evidence based so it's not subjective use it's actually they're thinking about it um in, in a structured manner and then if i have the confidence they're applying that in my business and i can see some of those real benefits coming through today so there's less ownership by me and then sophie is actually now got a a, a better commercial team and is applying those leadership skills already in her team and um, to other peri uh, other areas of the business. Fantastic. I think with the um, the quarterly review meetings as well, they do help bring a little bit of focus, like back back to it, because we've always got in the back of our mind. You know, I know I'm I'm still at about a, a good way away from it yet, but there's like the endpoint assessment and the strategic business proposal. So I think even like you know before starting or like really early on in the course to get a good idea of what you want to get out of it and the strategic business proposal is is quite a, a big piece of work and you, you know you want something where you can really showcase what you've learned so that was like something that we've sort of talked about early on which I think has helped give a bit of focus um, and then like I say as well yeah being able to discuss future projects coming up in the business that I could potentially use you know the KSBs on and get some OTJ in the logs <laughs> because like John says you know it is, it is a scary thing having someone you know being basically like a day a week out of office working on uni work um, because it is meant to be 20% of your time um, but there's other things it's, it doesn't just have to be a day a week there's other things like last uh, last week we went down to one of our customers on a sustainability conference and you know from from chatting through with you carol that's not something that i would normally get involved in um but sustainability is one of the ksbs and being able to put some of that time towards it um it helps to make it seem not so scary fantastic that's the kind of thing that is obviously really important and then john can make that link as his, your work-based mentor with the ksbs which is not yeah. natural coming doesn't actually come to you does it i suppose yeah. Correct. So you want you want to give the apprentices um, exposure to different things outside their job. If you do that, it's amazing how they can use those skills they're learning, transferable, and therefore add a real benefit back to your business. And um, you know, for for those people on the call, when you have a quite a narrow management team like I've got, you, yourself as a, as a business leader in your own company, I'm not talking about industry leader here. <laughs> my own business is that you're always thinking continuously about the business how you can move it forward and transform trans transformation so you feel there's this huge responsibility for the people you work for as well as business continuity and it's really great when you have some younger people who have you know proven themselves either before they've come to the company or they've proven themselves in the business to actually show uh, an aptitude to want to develop themselves and then they add that value back to the business. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a like Sophie said, you know, about the sustainability. You know, everyone's looking about greenness and what we can do. So we're looking at putting um, solar, solar uh, panels into our building on the roof. And therefore, we're going to put energy back into the grid. Well, that's a great opportunity for, I think it's an OTJ. Yeah, yeah for a, a, a KFB. <laughs> I get mixed up with the OTBs and the KFBs, <laughs> but it's a great object uh, 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 um, task for Sophie to evolve herself in on a commercial basis, then onto a product and sustainability, working with our, somebody on our product team to actually deliver something to help her to achieve this uh, this qualification. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you so much, both of you. Do we have any questions for Sophie and John from our callers? Um, no, not yet. Although yeah. I might ask a question, if that's OK. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so I think because I'm a practice based tutor too with another group, um, and I think probably I've got a bit of a tutory question, but it sounds like you've been able to apply quite a lot of what you've learned in class um to what you're doing right now Sophie is that right yeah yeah that's right I think the best way I can like 
describe it in terms of like an analogy is when I remember when I bought my car that I currently have and I'd never heard of that model before and then as soon as I'd like bought it I started seeing them like everywhere on the road mm. and I feel like it wasn't just because everyone had suddenly gone out and bought the same car that I had that they were always there it's just because like I'd, I'd started noticing them more and I feel like that's what's happening on this apprenticeship is that when we're going through the units like we're currently just finished about to finish innovation so we're a distribution company we don't manufacture anything really and I always think of innovation as like Apple or Dyson and those sort of companies and I thought this might be a bit of a stretch for us but really there's other types of innovation like process innovation and I think oh yeah actually you know that's really really um applicable to us and we can start using this and it's not that all of a sudden just needed to innovate there's probably always been that in the background that things we can prove on but because I've not had that knowledge behind me I've not known to go and look for that and I guess there is sort of some some good timing in that we're getting a new supply chain manager so it's ideal to sort of induct perhaps him in a way focused towards that and can use the KSBs and the OTJ in that way but even you know if that didn't happen there'd still be the opportunity to do it and yeah I think for me like that's been one of the biggest um realizations from doing the courses. Brilliant and it's funny that you use that um analogy because with my kind of group I often use car as an analogy too because it's a learnt skill isn't it? it is like driving because yeah. we're not kind yeah. of born knowing how to do this so I think that's really powerful sort of analogy to use it's that kind of recurrence um uh, yeah just noticing things that you sort of already know but it kind of crops up so that's really good that's really interesting yeah thank you yeah all right <laughs> great thank you thanks so we've got a question from Jill yeah um about how other colleagues view or comment on what they see arising from Sophie being on the apprenticeship Jill do you mean other colleagues within Gleave? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, what What are they witnessing? Are they making any comments to John and Sophie? Um, that's John. a difficult one. John. I think <laughs> I think um, every every Friday. So we have like an open office space, and I tend to do my apprenticeship work on a Friday. And so I'll go into like an, another office and try and shut myself out, so I don't get disturbed too much. And, uh, I don't know, I feel like that might be a bit of an annoyance to some people. Mm. Um, it's a tricky one to navigate. Like I had a, a situation where I asked, you know, someone to help me do some research for something, um, you know, I was, I was hoping to implement and it didn't go down too well. Um, and I've sort of spoke through that through with Carol and perhaps thought of ways that I can come about it a bit differently in the business in that, you know, it, uh, although it's me that's doing it, it it's going to benefit everyone. Um, so I think trying to, yeah, perhaps come about it in a different way with colleagues if I sort of need their assistance and trying to get them. I think now they're used to me um, being in the office in a separate place on a Friday. So they do kind of factor that into if they need me for something, they'll need to ask me one of the other four days of the week. Um, but I think it, it has been a bit challenging, I would say. I think people, um, nobody said anything directly to me, but you can look at people's human mannerisms and you know, the rolling the eyebrows or, or the <laughs> or lifting the eyebrows or rolling the eyes. So I think you can read into it. I think what you've got to do is um, that person's got to show great credibility in the business and uh, have a certain characteristics. So that can understand why that person's been selected to go on this leadership course. And if they are a, a manager and they're starting to lead or are leading a team, I think then there's a, a greater understanding of why that person's being, uh, it's been selected and is being privileged, you could say, to have, you know, seven or eight hours per week dedicated to that course. Um, I think that it, it's down very much to, um, how the management team wish to engage with the other people uh, to ensure that they keep the buy-in to it. Um, and because we have got about 20 people in our office environment, um, and it's very much a, a, a small, closely knit team, my involvement and guidance and how I communicate it through various discussions 
is 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 quite essential for people to be on board. Excellent, thanks, John. I think we also talked about sharing the benefits and rewarding and recognising the benefits of Sophie being on the apprenticeship if things have been improved, processes are improved, to tell people and link it directly to the programme and that makes others in the organisation start to see the benefits as well as Sophie's development. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 exactly, Carol. Um, <clears throat> It's, you've got to have the confidence in the candidate and if you've got confidence in the candidate and you give them a freedom uh, without keeping them too restricted it's amazing what they'll deliver back mm -hmm. so you're selecting that to, for, for selecting that the, the the right person to become your apprentice just like lord sugar does in that you know program that's been running for about 15 <laughs> years you know probably losing a little bit of its legs in, that, in my opinion but i think you know it's what you want to gain out of it and because um, Sophie is going to be working very closely with several new managers that's going to come in um, and she's going to be uh, becoming a, more, a critical person within the business. So giving her opportunities that don't that are not normally recognisable in her role and um, that are going to help the wider business is absolutely essential. I'm sure that your other organisations that are on this on this on this chat can um, explore different opportunities for those of apprentices and you know, it's amazing mm -hmm. what you'll they'll deliver. Thanks John I think that's one of the questions uh, we've had in the chat about how John supports Sophie with the KSBs that are not normally part of Sophie's job role for this learn for Fawcett's learner it's about things such as procurement where she doesn't have capacity to do the work mm -hmm. in that area in her normal job and we can talk to you that we can talk to you offline on that for it as well because this is about looking at those hard to reach areas but making sure that we can change the training plan i'm going to come because kieran's put his hand up kieran can you respond to that for us well it's just an additional thing carol so so rowan i think um you're part of the manchester, manchester university nhs foundation trust we obviously have other people on the program similarly who are mentors but perhaps in different areas now, if you want, we can pick this up and maybe connect you with other mentors from elsewhere in your broader organisation. So if there are people who do have that procurement experience uh, that maybe mirrors the areas that they need to get involved with from you, maybe there's a we would actually encourage sort of mentors to support each other within organisations. Obviously, that's limited in, in, in the size of organisation you're working in. But where possible, um, we'd like to create and foster and encourage a, a community of practice where mentors talk to each right. other. Uh, and again, sort of John, uh, you coming on today is, is, is testimony to that. So thank you for that. So Rowan, I'm more than happy to connect with you offline and, and maybe suggest a few other names of people you might be able to connect with within within the sort of the broader Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust. Is that OK? Hi, Karen. I'll just put my camera on. That's uh, easier. Sorry, just clicking through. Um, yes, that'd be helpful. Um, I, th I think the challenge really I've, I've found for my learner, though, is, um, you know, because we're such a big organisation, for certainly for things such as um, I don't know some of the um, the finance, procurement, sustainability sort of KSBs. We would have there would be opportunities potentially for people to have involvement on it, but we do have specialists in those areas. So I think it's it's easier to um, identify opportunities to learn and to um, to shadow to you know to get involved, but to actually have experience of owning a procurement project or seeing something through would be so far out of their remit and would be somebody else's job normally to do that's quite hard to um actually facilitate in in an area where the capacity anyway is challenged so certainly the sort of understanding and um looking at opportunities but i think the bit that my learner gets concerned about i think is yes i can I can find out about that area, but am I actually going to be able to demonstrate evidence that I've done it is is much more difficult. And I think that's a little bit unclear about how far you need to go into some of those areas. Yeah, Rowan, that's exactly sorry, I got your name wrong. Sorry, earlier. Rowan, that's okay. a really important part because each individual apprentice, that's why you have their own uh, learning plan. So we will talk to you and we can 
put you in touch with others, just not necessarily in the NHS. But there are ways that we can actually tailor it and make it applicable to your learner's own area. But it's too too wide to go in. We'd need to go into detail. Yeah, that's fine. But yeah, please reach out to us. We'd love to help with that to take away that fear for your own learner. Great. Right, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Beth. No worries. I, I think just to answer your question, is increasing awareness enough? Unfortunately not. We need to show application. So but we'll come back yeah. to help you on that. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John and Sophie. Are you happy to stay on with us and hear Courtney speak? We might have more questions for you at the end, if that's all right. Yeah. So I'm going to hand over to Courtney. Um, I'll stop sharing, Courtney, and let you take over, if that's all right. Welcome, Courtney. Over to you. All right. Can you see that? OK, we can. Yes, thank Lovely. you. Lovely. Thank you. All right. So hello, everyone. Um, just to say hi, uh, my name is Courtney Owens. I'm originally from Seattle, the northwest part of the US. I'm now in Manchester in the northwest part of the UK. Um, the weather is very similar, Seattle and Manchester. So this has quickly become home. Um, for me. I came here to do my PhD um, in personality traits and management and was offered a job, so I stayed and I'm now um, lecturing and researching in the areas of personality traits and management and leadership. Um, what does personality mean for our leadership style? How do we manage and lead people well um, based on who we are and getting to know ourselves better? So I just wanted to talk today a little bit about this concept called the incomplete leader that we like to share, uh, particularly on our executive education programs. Um, so when you're in the workplace and um, actually working, it's really easy to grasp and understand the, the power of this idea. So the incomplete leader is a model of distributive leadership. There's all kinds of different conversations out there about leadership and how do we define leadership and models of leadership. Uh, so a distributive leadership model is one where we want to share the leadership tasks. Um, so this is one way of thinking about that, which is great from a perspective of diversity and inclusion. Um, it's another way of thinking about how important it is to have those different voices around the table, whether that diversity comes from skills, or background, or gender, or personality traits, perhaps, is another way of looking at diversity and who's around the table. So this is another concept called the incomplete leader that uh, sort of encompasses all of that. All right, so there's, um, before the incomplete leader, and why we need the incomplete leader is this idea of the heroic leader, that the, the times we're in and the, the um, global working environment that we're in today, the heroic leadership style no longer works. So what is it, what's a heroic leader? Heroic leadership is this style like Superman, right? Swoops in and saves the day. I've got all the answers, I put out the fire and then off they go and they're no longer there. Um, so it, it does work. Um, it is effective in some situations, but it's much less effective in today's work environment. There's this term called VUCA, V-U-C-A, stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that very much describes our global work environment today. Uh, it used to be before COVID, I had to argue that we lived in a VUCA environment, I think post COVID now and climate change and wars and all these things that impact us. Um, there, there's no need to argue <laughs> how volatile and complex um, and uncertain our world is. You just, you can't predict what's going to happen um, tomorrow or next week or next year. Uh, it, it's volatile. One day it's this, the next day it's this. Um, we can't know that's so complex in today's world. Um, not only, um, of course, on a global scale, but our own work 
has become more complex. People working from home, supply chain that is in various countries around the world and how they, res how they responded to COVID was differently than how we did. And we saw the effect in the supermarkets on, the, on just that supply chain issue. So things are just getting more and co more complex um, as time goes on. So how do, we, how do we lead in this kind of world that's challenging? Um, leadership is challenging anyway, um, but this complexity and uncertainty, how do we do this well and be good leaders? So the answer um, for today's environment is this concept called the incomplete leader. And there's a great article that captures it really well called In Praise of the Incomplete Leader. And it was written by Deborah Ancona and her colleagues. She's a professor at MIT. Um, and if you have access to Harvard Business Review, you can get a copy of this article. Um, any of our students here at the university can access it. And usually you can get on their website and get a few pre, a few articles every month. So you might um, be interested in getting a copy. It's really accessible, um, readable. It's about five pages long. So anyone with a business background um, would enjoy the article. So there's two big ideas that I'm going to talk about that they present in the article. And, and one big idea is, is this. The successful leader in today's world is incomplete. So here's a, a quote from their article that they talk about this. Um, they say this. It's time to end the myth of the complete leader, the flawless person at the top who's got it all figured out. Only when leaders come to see themselves as incomplete, as having both strengths and weaknesses, will they be able to make up for their missing skills by relying on others. So in our apprenticeship programs, in our leadership development programs, um, this is why we attend the programs, right? We, we recognize we have weaknesses, so we want to work on them, which is great. That's definitely something we want to do. But another way to address those weaknesses and gaps is to look at who's around you and you can make up for some of those skills and gaps by relying on other people to fill that. So what we'll do often with our personality traits and recognize, oh, that's a challenging thing for me to do. Maybe there's somebody else around the table who has that perspective or has that high level of empathy that they can go out and help me to manage that situation. So that's the, the idea here is um, diversity, right? Being able to find people who can fill those gaps um, that you have. Now, one way to think about gaps is, as I said before, gender or skills um, or personality traits. And another way is to think about leadership capabilities. So this is what they present in the article from their research they've done, that there's four capabilities that the leadership team needs to be able to do well, to lead well. So you can have good leaders and you can have poor leaders, of course, and we all want to be good leaders. So how do we lead well? Well, there's four categories that are really important for good leadership. And what we find is um, not everybody is good at everything. So again, identifying your strengths and your weaknesses and saying that's okay. So play to your strengths and whatever is more challenging for you, find people, bring them around the table with you and you can lead together. So their model of leadership capabilities, they have these four categories, visioning, inventing, sense-making and relating. So visioning um, is pretty straightforward. It's this idea of creating that picture of the future. What, where is it we want to go? That's the direction we want to go. That's where we want to be. Let's all go this direction. So there's this level of visioning that's important. Um, inventing. So inventing is different than visioning. Visioning is that great idea, but inventing is, well, that's great, but how are we going to get there? Because where we are today is different from where we want to be. So there's things we need to change to get to that vision. And sometimes those are very different people. You get someone who has a great vision, but they don't know all of the logistical steps and policies and strategies that need to be put in place 
that that's just not how their brain works. They're great at coming up with the great big picture. And somebody else comes along and says, yeah, I can follow that. And here's the steps we need to do to get there. So visioning and inventing. And then sense making and relating. Um, sense making, very much someone who can look at the current situation. It's complex, interconnected parts, being able to sort out the context and make sense of this. People can look at a data set, two different people look at the data set and come out with two different um, observations, two different recommendations, right? So it's somebody who can look at the big picture, make sense of what's going on, relate that to somebody who can then do the inventing to help us get to that new vision. And then relating, building relationships with other people in the organization. Um, very much that person who's just the natural networker. They like to get out there and be talking to people. We know communication is super important to good leadership. If people feel like they're not being communicated with, um, our leadership scores go down. So relating is really important. So having somebody who's very natural and comfortable with building those relationships, getting that communication out there to um, the wider organization and then outside the organization. Sometimes there's external stakeholders that need to be um, regularly communicated with as well. So that level of relating is really important. So what I thought we'd do, if you wanna grab um, your phone or a pen and pencil and just make some notes and I'm gonna have you score yourself just kind of for fun here and we'll go through each one, okay? So visioning. And what we're going to do is score yourself from a, a rating of zero to five and how often in your current position, how often or how frequently do you perform this particular thing? So visioning, um, are you a zero to a five? How frequently are you doing it? And this is what visioning is, right? Is creating that picture of the future. What is that future picture we want to go to? I, I've got it in my head. I know what it looks like and I'm able to communicate it to other people. So being able to articulate, that's the picture and that's where I want to be in a week, in a month, in a year, in 10 years, whatever the, the timeline, you just have a very clear picture of where you want this group of people to go. So rate yourself there and give yourself a number. Okay. And then um, the next one, I can get my screen here. There we go. Inventing. So again, from zero to five. So inventing is transforming the current present day reality to get to that vision. So if you're really good at um, detail and execution, implementing things. Um, so this takes someone who just is good at organizing, interacting with others, project management skills probably. Um, and it's not only big large scale issues but also these day-to-day -day things what how does the work today maybe need to change um, in order to accomplish that there's several steps along the way so give yourself a rating there um, on inventing from zero to five okay next one sense making so this is looking at your current situation and being able to capture all of the complexities, all of the issues, having a, an overarching um, view of the current situation, being able to sort it out, get multiple data, figure it out what's going on, capture all those complexities, sort it out, and then explain it to others as well. So there's this communication piece as well, of being able to share with others what you've been able to figure out. So again, give yourself a rating from zero to five. Okay. And lastly, relating. So this idea of building relationships, particularly trusting good foundational strong relationships. So it's not just a, an email once a year, <laughs> but it's actually building a relationship with somebody right? That you have a relationship, you understand their perspective and how they see it. So it's not just a one-way communication, but it's also getting the feedback and hearing from their perspective what's important to them, um, showing actual concern and care for them as people, 
Um, not just, like I said, not just that one way communication, but an actual relationship. Um, creating environments around you for other people to grow and develop. So very much um, within the organization, um, particularly with those in your immediate circle, but then also reaching out to the wider environment as well. Okay, so give yourself another rating there from zero to five. Okay, all right, so take a look at your ratings and you'll probably see you score high on some, but not all. And, and that's the whole point of the incomplete leader, that you're gonna naturally do things and naturally feel inclined, um, or by, by virtue of your job description, do certain things and not others. So naturally, we need others around us to fill those gaps. And so it's just one way of measuring the gaps. Um, what you're good at, and there's, there's areas that are gaps for you that you might want to reach out and find somebody who's naturally good at those things, or as part of their job, that's just naturally what they do on a regular basis, and that will help fill these gaps, because these four particular, um, these four particular concepts are very important for overall good leadership. So, um, just to kind of sum it up and, and close, Another quote from their article, sometimes leaders need to further develop the capabilities they are weakest in. Other times it's more important for leaders to find and work with others to compensate for their weaknesses. So the, the picture of the puzzle here, right, is very much this idea of finding others who can compensate where your gaps are. Um, it's a great way to have, uh, to share Leadership, distributive leadership, find people around you that you can trust and work with um, and compensate for each other's gaps. The other way to do it is to develop those capabilities that you're weak in, and that's great. We want to see that too as part of our leadership development programs. That's what we do. So it's a two pronged strategy. We want to be um, improving ourselves, but also recognizing that's okay to have gaps. That's okay, we're all human and we all know we're all human. Um, and it's very empowering when you reach out to others and invite them to help fill those gaps that are um, more challenging for you. So it's a great leadership tool. It's a great leadership style. Um, I'd highly recommend it. Um, so yeah, so I would agree with Ancona and colleagues that um, incomplete leader is the way to go for the future. So let me pause there and um, I'll come back to you, Carol. Did you want to take some questions or comments? Yeah, well, I, well, I've got a question as well. So I will open it up to the floor. If we've got any questions, put that in the chat box or put your hand up. Courtney, I just scribbled down. I was I was hoping you weren't going to answer for the answers for what I wrote down. Um, but would you ask other people to do this for you? Would you? rate yourself mm. and then say what do you think have you done that before yeah so that's great thank you um so especially in personality when we look at personality traits predicting job performance there's a huge difference in how other people perceive us and how we perceive ourselves so when we do academic research um, if we're looking for the ability to predict your performance on a job we find that there is much much higher explanatory power when other people rate your personality than when you rate it yourself. For example, um, conscientiousness is the be best predictor of job performance, but it only explains 5% of the variance in your job. So if we go out and ask your work colleagues what they think about your level of conscientiousness, it suddenly jumps to 30% of your job performance can be explained by the one trait of conscientiousness as judged by your work colleagues. So I would say the same thing about this, about your how you view your own capabilities. Um, there's there's a lot of value in finding out how other people see you as well. Absolutely, you want to recognize what you believe about yourself, of course, but to go out and check with others. Um, leadership is a relational thing. And if you want to have people following you, you want to um, validate their perspective of you. So just because of what you have in your head is not necessarily the same thing they think about you. 
So having that kind of conversation where you can get feedback from them on their perspective on you is it can be really valuable and really help. Um, and it's empowering to the person that you're asking to. Brilliant. No, that's right. Yeah. We do. As part of the senior leadership program, the apprenticeship, we have our apprentices do Hogan. Mm -hmm. And this is where the Hogan, so I see Sophie nodding, this is where Hogan really comes into itself. Sophie, can yeah. I come to you? What what were your thoughts on that when you linking it back to Hogan? Yeah, yeah, it was really interesting. John and I were actually doing it together. He said he scored himself as four for the visionary, and I was really harsh and said he would be zero. <laughs> so it just like shows you the difference. It's going to be the extra apprentice. <laughs> I know, because I guess it means different things to different people as well, like how you interpret it. So I know, like John, your way of communicating is very, you know, like off the cuff as you're passing by, having a chat, you know, in the canteen or whatever it is, which is great. But sort of for me, it's more like, you know, though, like bulletins and things like that to get out to, to the whole workforce, because when you're having those chats, you're maybe not speaking to every single person in the business. So to me, it's like it means different things. So, yeah, when we did the Hogan, there was definitely I think there was some things that I, I, I wasn't really surprised with, but there were other things where I thought of like I didn't think I was like that at all. Um, but like when when you go through it, like I think Carol, you you went through mine with me, and when you actually explain what it means, um, it's not what it seems at, at face value. And yeah, you've got to remember it's it's not how you think of yourself; it's how other people see you. Yeah. Courtney, do you do this with leaders all the time? Then I mean, is this something that you just naturally use with people? And are you evaluating people without thinking about it when you're talking to them? <laughs> I do with personality traits. <laughs> <laughs> but the, this the incomplete leader concept has really become really important. You know, we have a team of academics here at the business school that study all kinds of things, strategy and innovation, organizational psychology. And this idea of the incomplete leader and distributive leadership styles just really resonates across the board with any department, any division, and it's remained stable. This article was published in 2007, and it's more than relevant today. It, it hasn't gone out of style. It hasn't gone out of fashion. It's um, We teach it on most of our executive education programs and constantly getting feedback from those in the room, senior executives even, right? To just take a step back and, and take a breath and go, oh, it's okay to be incomplete. That's okay. Even just that acknowledgement, that's a big thing. Where we all know it and we look at each other and we, la we allow each other to be okay, but we often don't allow ourselves to be okay with the idea of being incomplete. Um, so to kind of wrestle through that, and um and apply that in reality it, it can be really powerful fantastic yeah. thanks Courtney do we have any other questions from anyone Louise Kieran are you anything to add or ask no I just sort of what it was thinking it was weird I was speaking to a colleague about um how leadership has changed since the pandemic Courtney mm. um and I know you sort of touched on it before but I just wondered if you could say a bit more about how 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 it's changed, I suppose, if that change is permanent, you think? Mm -hmm. From an industry perspective, um, not talking politics or, <laughs> yeah, or things yeah. like that, but from an industry <laughs> perspective, I, I think it's, it's the recognition of how difficult leadership is, how complex things really are. And so it kind of feels like we're in this stage of still just We've gotten through the crisis. We've put out the fires. You know, we've we've gotten past that now. So now it's this: take a breath. What what happened? Can we sort through all of this? Can we learn from that? And is there anything we need to change going forward? So we're kind of. It feels like we're kind of in this phase of trying to still figure out the new normal is kind of settling with the hybrid working and all that. Um, so we're kind of just beginning to see people returning back to some level of normality, but recognizing that we've learned some things. What does this mean? So we're still kind of in this transition stage of just um, putting into practice those lessons learned, the levels of complexity. I don't know everything. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. That means I need more people around the table. I need a variety of voices. Diversity and inclusion is so important to getting those 
perspectives. Um, I think it's just sort of settling in now and, and we're recognizing those implications and trying to figure out the new way forward. Right. So it's a yeah. lot of reflection at the moment. Even yeah. On yeah. This yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I think I'd just like to add from obviously a PBT point of view, but working with a lot of apprentices, I can see Sarah, I'm working closely with Sarah, I'm one of our apprentices, that these are the kind of conversations we can have with our apprentices. You know, it's you don't you cannot be the perfect, complete leader. There are always going to be areas. And it's trying to encourage particularly people moving into new senior roles that they don't have to have the answers to everything, Courtney, you know, and you, we can help them, can't we, as PBTs? I see Mike nodding there. I can't see everybody. But, you know, when people and that's important, Mike, you were nodding there. Do you want to add anything to that for us? Uh, thank you. Uh, just really to echo and support a lot of what Courtney was saying in the presentation and uh, in the subsequent dialogue uh, back and forth with Louise and one or two others, in that, you know, uh, there's nothing new about, uh, there's been no new trends in performance management for 20 or 30 years. It's all about how a leader interacts with his or her colleagues mm -hmm. and tries to inspire, motivate, get the best out of them and recognise that no one person has all the answers and a collaborative or teamwork uh, approach is often better and and to have an element of vulnerability as a leader is a good thing you know people respond to that respect it and motivate and, and, and get inspired by it so it's it's all about treating people with respect with value recognizing what piece you know each member of your team can bring to the party what value they can add in whatever way shape or form, recognise the strengths and weaknesses and find a way of working together and harmonising that as a collaborative approach. And, you know, before you know it, your team are, uh, are making you a better leader. So why not embrace it? Absolutely. Yeah. So no such thing as a, a one stop shop, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I've learned that over many, many years, many, many years. <laughs> no, thank you, Mike. Really appreciate that. Sarah, oh. did you want to add anything? I know I could see you nodding and I've just been not not something to add, but I've just been reflecting um, about relationships and personality types. And I was just thinking about the relationship between a work based mentor and a learner and mm -hmm. the differences that you. Having different personality types, the the, the richness that brings to that working relationship yeah. as you're supporting someone through a program like this. And I was just I was just reflecting on what's different about me and my um, learner Chris and what's similar about it because we do take a very similar approach on some things and in some other respects we are utterly different and it leads to some really interesting conversations some of those that you've been part of with us Carol which is whether that Courtney whether you had any reflections on that and what we can take away from that as, as mentors oh it's a good question um so so there's um there's some research out there about learning styles but um the academic research is not validated that those learning styles are so important so i think it's great to to approach it from a concept of personality traits rather than learning styles um so so i i like that idea and um i think that's a great way to approach it what does that mean though um it means like you say there's some areas you'll be similar some areas that are are really different the the richness comes in the conversation um so even when things are similar that's okay it doesn't mean you're going to miss a learning point it just means it's a different conversation um but when you are similar it's maybe a, a challenge to keep your eyes open for potential blind spots because if if well, it's like the idea um, of um, group think. So there's, we see in group work, right, that if you get a lot of similar people or people are afraid to challenge the status quo, then everybody's agreeing and you're not necessarily going to have the best solution. And sometimes we have dangerous situations occur because people did, were afraid to um, speak up when they knew something was wrong. So there's blind spots that it can occur when people all think the same way. Um, not that that's bad, not that you still can't learn, but it's just kind of a, a, a red flag and, and a warning to say, okay, we are similar and that's fine, 
but is there something about that similarity that we need to make sure and be aware of because it could impact us or affect um, our thinking in, in some way? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Courtney. That's really, it's fascinating. I, I, I've i learned some that VUCA, never heard of that. So I'll keep, <laughs> I'll keep it, that in the background. I just want to say, has anybody got any final questions? We're conscious of five minutes left in the, the chat, in the call, I should say. John, I'll just come back to you if you don't mind me coming back to you. But interesting, when I was scribbling down when Courtney was talking about how it's about in identifying skills and strengths and weaknesses which to me is exactly what you were saying about why you're working so well and you're so pleased with Sophie's progress did you want to did you agree with what Courtney yeah, was saying I, there? I, 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 it's interesting the piece that uh, Courtney was talking about uh, the incomplete leader and you know it's it I would say as a leader it, it, only in my business because I've been in this business for 40 years you feel as if you need to have the answer to everything and everyone looks to you and you've got to feel as if you've got to have the answer for everyone. And if you don't, you feel it's a failure. So one of the thing, things that, is, that, that drives me on is a fear of failure in life and in business. So I never look back and sort of say, wallow in the success. I always think, oh, can that be done better? So you're always being self-critical, which is quite, you can be very, very hard on yourself. And I would say that I've done that over many, many years. Um, so when you look at that piece you said about the incomplete leader with the strengths and weaknesses, I can look at that and, and I think that, you know, it's, I, I, I can get on board with that. What I've done is that because and I may have done it too later in my life in the sense that I'm 59, you know, I'm still in my business. I want to continue the business for another 20, uh, another 10 years till I'm 70 is to bring on board <clears throat> younger people or people with different skill sets to complete where my weaknesses are. So I've recognized, may have taken me 40 damn years to realize <laughs> I have weaknesses, but you know, I recognize our weaknesses. And even somebody like Sophie, who is significantly younger than me, um, significantly. significantly younger, yeah, okay, get the trip. Um, <laughs> she can add real benefit from the business because she has developed her skill set, even at her tender age compared to mine. So what she doesn't have, but it's what I've got in, in abundance is experience and knowledge. What she's got is um, you know, levels of degree, of business acumen um, and, and new skills she can bring in. So it's a bit like the older than you. And that's picking up in Courtney, the weakness. And like she was like Sophie was saying, you, you know, I'm yeah, I'm I talk and uh, contact various people and have you know, chats periodically throughout the day. So I'm very much in touch with the business. Where Sophie's position is, she's coming in where more a structure, not more formal, but more clearer, bringing in a business objectives and rather than rooting around in my head and putting them on a few notice boards, but formal, formulating them and then actually getting the buy into the business. And then what we're going to do is tumble those down through uh, different ways of uh, people's um, uh, objectives and how they can deliver to the overall strategy. So it's having the new ways of learning which are the night for me you know from when i was at school in the 70s and then uh, at the early 80s is to take this new way of working and not not the new is always better sometimes it's a, a blend of the old and new and putting them together and that's what i'm doing in my business mm -hmm. and i can see when the other recruitments we're making safely in the business that are coming from different backgrounds where they are actually got a, 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 what I call like the old a, a analogy. I've got a, rare, a round peg in a round hole rather than a square peg in a, in a round hole. So I'm making sure I've got what I call people with backgrounds that are, uh, are coming into the organisation. And they might be young, they might be older, but they've actually got a skill set in that specific area. So what that happens for me is that if that person leaves, and at least we've got somebody that can come in um, and re replace it. It's it's uh, where before we had what I call some very general people in my organisation that are there uh, have different skill sets to, across different areas. And if those people left, it left us a huge hole in the organisation. So we've got people more fitting to that role, and therefore in doing so, whether it's old or new uh, experience, we've now got um, uh, a better blend. So yeah, the incomplete leader um, definitely. Uh, is what I would say I've recognised that I am, and I'm addressing that now. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you, Courtney. That was super, really, really interesting. Uh, just to say thank you to you for your time. John and Sophie, thank you. Hugely helpful to hear from what it's like to be in that position. We're always going to say it's a great thing to do, but thank yeah. you both so much. And thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us today. The recording will be available if you wish to revisit or share with colleagues. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Carol. Bye -bye. Take time. Thanks, Bye. John. Bye. Bye.